coming up next on Making Moves. I'm Terry Casey. So, you think an invisible shield helps protect us during hurricane season? Wait till you hear what I found out at the National Weather Service. That story coming up. The JAX 2025 survey results are in what people said about their transportation needs. And could a Skyway expansion be right around the corner? We'll tell you where JTA is looking to take the train next. I'm Joyce Morgan Danford. Those stories and much more next on Making Moves. Welcome to Making Moves. I'm Joyce Morgan Danford. Just days into the 2013 hurricane season, Tropical Storm Andrea reminded us why we must all remain vigilant. Coming up a little later in our show, Making Moves senior correspondent Terry Casey takes us to the National Weather Service to show us how storms like Andrea are tracked. But first, after months of preparation and surveying thousands of citizens across our region, the Jacksonville Community Council releases its long-awaited JAX 2025 study report. The report focuses on the top 10 areas the community as a whole thinks is critical to shaping our future, including transportation. From our downtown skyline laced with bridges and the St. John's River to the breathtaking view of our beaches and golf courses, Jacksonville is a city on the move. But what direction will we take? That's a question we don't want to leave up for chance. So an initiative through JCCI is engaging businesses, organizations, and citizens to get involved in shaping the future of our city. I think you can think of the Jax 2025 report as answering the question, what do we want to be when we grow up? It really is a way that the entire community could, had an opportunity to come together and to say, here's, where we want to, here's what we want Jacksonville to look like. Here's some measures of progress to say, how do we know whether or not it's happening? And then, what are the strategies we're going to use to get there? Both individual strategies and institutional strategies. JCCI Executive Director Ben Warner says 16,000 residents completed the survey, voicing their opinions on what's important to improving life in Jacksonville. The 10 initiatives all ranked equally are arts and entertainment, clean and green, the environment, diverse and inclusive community, neighborhoods, people, governance, transportation, health, education, and the economy. Warner says that this study is totally unique because it takes a look at the big picture here in Jacksonville, and that means Jacksonville starts on a positive note. But sometimes we forget how wonderful it is. And if we focus in on where we want to be, then we can handle the problems along the way. And we can make decisions in, in public policy, in, in business, and in nonprofit organizations. We can make decisions on, on the actions that we take on whether or not it brings us closer to this vision or whether it takes us farther away. The key to this entire process is individual participation. Surveys came from adults, teenagers, younger kids, 183 different zip codes, people with a lot of money and not so much. Now that people have said what they want, will they stand behind the process? We all want clean parks. We all want safe neighborhoods. We all want our kids to go to great schools. And so if we start there, I think that that's the beauty of the JAX 2025 Visioning Initiative. If we start right there, we begin to build this tapestry. Our differences are going to show up. Sometimes they're very, very obvious, right? But if we start where we connect, I think it's easier to grow. And it's more positive for the community because then we're not focusing on what's so different about you. JAX 2025 identifies transportation as a changing and evolving strategy and the heart of transforming Jacksonville. Regional mobility is the future, 2025. In the past, we've thought that people either had their own car or used public transportation because they couldn't afford a car. Now we're, we're facing a new situation where people are making choices uh, to use public transportation. Warner says all 10 pieces are interconnected and for the next 12 years the work will continue concurrently on each initiative. 
JCCI will lead the way in making sure they advocate for change, connect volunteers to the mission, and communicate each step to the community. This is a community that's ready for change. This is a community that knows where it wants to go. It's a community with people who volunteer at rates higher than the national average because they're ready to give to this community and to make Jacksonville really the place, the place it needs to be. And the JCCI says there is plenty of work to do, and the more people involved, the more we can get done and the faster we can get it done. In fact, JCCI hopes to accomplish all of these goals before 2025. And joining us now to discuss the results of this report is JTA's Vice President of Long Range Planning and System Development, Brad Thoburn. Well, Brad, you know, you've been a, a frequent guest um, many times as we tape, but this is your first time here on the set with us, so welcome, welcome, and welcome. It's good to be here. You know, looking at this JAX 2025 report, there are a lot of wonderful things that I've seen that could mm -hmm. come from this report, but what do you think are the benefits of it? Well, one of the great things is, is the timing is especially uh, fortuitous for us because with the new leadership team at JTA, we're really rethinking where we're heading as an agency, and so this is a great deal of public input that really gives us some guidance in terms of where the community wants us to go. And it really helps shape our vision as an agency going into the future. It's something that really is valuable to us right now. So when you looked at this report, were there any things in it that you found surprising? I don't know if I'd say they were surprising, but it sort of reaffirmed some things. One of the things that I noted was there's still, despite the fact that we made a lot of investments in transportation, there's still a strong desire and concern about the quality of our infra infrastructure and the choices that people have. There was a strong emphasis on choice, frankly, and the, uh, on, and the con connectivity in our system. So the other thing I think that was interesting is when we look at a report like this, we tend to go, well, what does it say about transportation? But if you look through the 10 different uh, uh, focus areas, there's a lot of transportation impacts in all of those. When you talk about economic development, healthy communities, communities, clean and green. Those are areas where we can have an impact, not only in the transportation section, but it throughout this entire report. Okay, we knew that transportation was going to be big just because of all the reasons that you just said. It, it seems to be that thread that goes throughout the community uh, no matter where you look at it. So uh, with this information, what can JTA do? Well, we're working on a number of items right now already that really kind of work nicely with this vision. We're looking at how does our system, um, uh, restructuring our routes, for example. It's been 30 years since we did major restructuring of our routes, and so now we're trying to take a look at how does uh, our system connect the activity centers, the employment centers, and population centers that have shifted over the last three decades. And in the report, they talk about the desire to make those connections, but also have a system that's a little more frequent in key areas has better connectivity, more direct service. Those are things that when we look at the bus rapid transit program, our system uh, restructuring of our routes, uh, and, and also looking at the regional connections, um, as it may be future commuter rail, but express bus services, park and ride. There are a lot of things that we're working on that really speak to the things that the people ask for in this report. And that's amazing because that's exactly what I was just going to ask you about that regional kind of thing. I mean, you're a long range planner looking at that. Uh, 16,000 people, yeah. just about 16,000 took part in this study. First of all, when you think about that, that's amazing that we had that many people engaged. That's, that's, that's a good start. It's super, and it's something that uh, really helps us as an agency. But as you said, that regional piece was something that we've been very interested in. Um, the establishment of a regional transportation commission that was just signed by the governor um, is, is something that will help us move forward collectively as a region. But we're also studying commuter rail. We're, we're doing the things we've been working with Clay County uh, in terms of park and ride development, developing express services and those kind of things. These things were, and, and we also uh, talk about the JRTC downtown, the regional transportation center, where there was an, a request in here to have connectivity and, and, and uh, focus on not just our local service, but regional and inner city services. So it, it's inner city bus, it's, it's the rail connection with the Amtrak, it's that future commuter, commuter rail, and even connecting in with the Skyway, all those things that that center does for us. So where do we go with all of this information? What's next? Well, I think the big thing for us is the blueprint for transportation excellence that we've been talking about, and that involves a whole lot of different elements. But the big thing is looking at our overall system, uh, getting out and engaging the public um, in terms of 
what do they want to see in our system and where, where are their issues and concerns and, and how can we make the, the, uh, the, the route structure work better. But then also looking at things like our alternative fuel strategy. Can we, you know, conversion to more hybrid or potentially compressed natural gas buses. Um, they all speak to things that are in this report. Um, and also, on, and frankly, on the roadside too, looking at mobility along an entire quarter, thinking about how we connect uh, 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 bicyclists and pedestrians to our transit, and working with our partners at the city and DOT in terms of making those things happen. Thanks so much, Brad. And, and we have much more to come on that, and of course, we'll be keeping you updated. In other news, JTA is hoping to expand the Skyway to one of the hottest sections of the city, the Brooklyn area of Riverside. Well, the authority has submitted a Tiger Grant application to get funding for a new Skyway station near its operations and maintenance center across from the Florida Times Union building on Riverside Avenue. Brooklyn will soon be home to two new developments that will include residential units, offices, retail, and an outdoor amphitheater called Unity Plaza. Retail plan for the area is expected to include a major pharmacy and a large organic grocer. Now, the Skyway has set record ridership numbers with more than a million trips taken over the past 12 months. Over 65,000 trips were taken during two recent festivals held in downtown Jacksonville. And of course, we are back with Brad Thoburn, JTA's Vice President of Long Range Planning and System Development. Who's the primary market for this new Skyway extension? Well, um, obviously it provides connectivity with an emerging area in downtown uh, or adjacent to downtown in the Brooklyn mm -hmm. neighborhood, which is really exciting. But the, the, the actual market is all of downtown uh, because we're talking about connecting uh, folks that are on the South Bank uh, and the new residential buildings there to a new commercial center, to the employment uh, uh, in the North Bank. So it's really about connectivity throughout downtown. So the market isn't just that small area of, of, of Brooklyn. It's all of downtown. And then, frankly, it's for the entire uh, city when you think about the ability of folks to come downtown or if they're working downtown but they may drive in or ride the bus and they can circulate through downtown easier and access in not only an employment location but residential and commercial centers. This sounds so exciting. It, it just sounds like one of those things that would be wonderful to the city. But when you think about it and you had to do this Tiger Grant, let me just um, tell our audience just a little bit more about that. Recently, the U.S. Department of Transportation announced that 568 applications for Tiger Grants in 2013 were submitted. Now, they totaled more than $9 billion. Yeah. But Brad, as you know, I mean, you're, you're well aware of this, unfortunately, only $474 million is available in the Tiger Grant program this year. That means there are going to be a lot of unhappy people, but um, how do you think JTA is going to fare through all of this, and where, and where do we stand and, and our strength through this? Well, clearly it's very competitive. Um, you have a, a lot of demand. There's a lot of need out there for in terms of transportation. Uh, we think we're well positioned. We looked at the first uh, four rounds of the Tiger Grants. We learned from the types of things that were funded and not funded. And, we, and so we've really, it, and, and when we chose the Skyway project, it really was driven by what were the criteria in the, the grant and what did we see being funded previously. Uh, so this is the type of project that, that does get funded. It's the right scale in terms of the overall cost. Um, but the other thing is it has a strong local match. And we also have a path to completion that's in a timeline that they're looking for. We own the property. We've done a lot of the preliminary planning work. We know we can get the environmental approvals quickly so we can get the project done in a, in a, in a timely fashion, which is one of the things they're looking for, in fact, demanding. But then it also meets the criteria in terms of mobility, sustainability, economic development, all those things. When you look at what's happening in Brooklyn, the strengthening of downtown, using a, an existing asset and making that function better, those are all things that they are looking for in this type of uh, grant application. So uh, it is competitive, but we put our, uh, really put a good foot forward on this one, and we're, we're, we're going to keep our fingers crossed. Now, one of the things you said, uh, completing it in a timely manner. So if JTA is awarded this, um, what's our timeline? Well, we are, we're, we're looking at a, a design build process that would get us to the point towards the end of, of next year where we would 
begin construction, uh, and maybe you know late 2014, early 2015. And it's probably about a two-year process. Um, and so, uh, in the world of transportation infrastructure, it's a it's a it's a fast project. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Two years. I know. That's fast. It, it is. It is. Unfortunately, uh, it does take some time, and you've got yes. to make sure you 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 do it right. And uh, and we will. And so uh, we're excited. We think this is a great opportunity to really build on the existing infrastructure that's there. We already we already have most of the track, so that's the beauty of this. We're talking about about a 700 foot extension, mm -hmm. but we're using the existing track that's there serving the operation and maintenance facility that's not used for passenger service. So that's another reason we think it's a very competitive grant because it's making better use of existing infrastructure. Absolutely, well thanks so much Brad. And of course thanks. we'll be following this story as well. Well, the Riverside Trolley has returned to its roots. The trolley is now running strictly as a lunchtime trolley service between 10.30 a.m. and 2.30 p.m. Monday through Friday. The trolley runs between the Jacksonville Landing and the Five Points area of Riverside. Well, Five Points is a really important area in Jacksonville. It's a, it's a cultural mesh and uh, people love to come here to get lunch, to hang out, and it's a big stop on people's lunch hour. Um, we even give discounts for people that come to Smoothie King from the Riverside Trolley. The JTA board also approved a price drop for the next 12 months. Each trolley ride is now only 75 cents. That's half the former cost. Meanwhile, the Beaches Trolley is also getting a makeover. JTA officials are expanding the trolley hours on weekends. In addition to its current schedule, the trolley will now run until 2 a.m. Friday night, from 10 a.m. to 2 a.m. Saturday, and from noon to 6 p.m. on Sunday. The rest of the current Beaches Trolley schedule and route will remain the same. The Beaches Trolley currently runs along A1A from the South Beach Parkway Shopping Center, that's the one with Target, and just south of JTB to the Atlantic Village Shopping Center at Atlantic Boulevard and Penman Road. The new hours go into effect beginning the July 4th weekend. It's just days into the new hurricane season and Jacksonville was staring straight into Tropical Storm Andrea. JTA buses were put on standby for possible evacuations as some senior centers and flooding prone areas were being closely monitored. Now, while damage turned out to be minimal, it surely was a wake up call as to what it could have been if this had been an actual hurricane. Well, Making Moves senior correspondent Terry Casey joins us now. Terry, should we be concerned that we had a tropical storm just days into hurricane season? You want me to start out with a one word answer? One word. All right, the experts say, and the one word is no. Oh, Thankfully, good. there doesn't seem to be any correlation between early season storms such as Andrea and just how the rest of the season's going to turn out to be. However, Andrea was certainly a good reminder that the hurricane season is here and that we need to be both aware of that and be vigilant. The folks at the National Weather Service certainly are. They monitor weather conditions around the clock 365 days a year. They use equipment that can paint really sobering images of the future with what-if scenarios. And of course they use records that take us into the past. It's hurricane season, and Florida's nearly 1,200 miles of coastline are potential targets on the state's three sides that touch the Gulf, the Straits, and the Atlantic. All are at risk. That includes Northeast Florida. But we have been pretty lucky over the years. Some say it's the shape of our coastline that wards off the storms. Others claim it's the area's geographic location. Here's what the guys at the National Weather Service say. First off, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. And if we go back into the 19th century, there is a significant hurricane history in northeast Florida and southeast Georgia, including the city of Jacksonville. Al Sandrick, formerly with the National Hurricane Center, is a meteorologist at the National Weather Service office in Jacksonville and says the area was peppered by major hurricanes in the 19th century. Just because we don't remember it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Many people do remember Dora. She tore through in 1964. And if we had a repeat of Hurricane Dora, there would be tremendous damage to our coastal infrastructure. Whether it's Dora, Andrea, or some other storm, tracking begins early on. Well, we begin tracking a storm a lot of times in the computer models and on satellite imageries days in advance of the system actually becoming a storm. 
But when you look at the real big hurricanes, they actually come off the coast of Africa. It's a long journey, and the ones that hold together feed off the warm, deep waters becoming larger and more powerful on their way across the Atlantic. People have to realize that water kills, and it is one of the most dangerous parts of a hurricane, either freshwater flooding or storm surge. Northeast Florida and Southeast Georgia has a dubious distinction of being one of the highest storm surge potential areas along the eastern seaboard of the United States. The reason for that is that shape of the coastline that people like to talk about. What's the potential storm surge from a Category 4 hurricane that hits these areas? We look at Georgia first. And to give you an idea, near St. Simon's Lighthouse, we could see 23 feet of storm tide with waves on top of that. In Brunswick, we could see 12 feet of storm tide, and at the Kings Bay Submarine Base, 18 feet. What we're looking at on the second screen is the same scenario for Northeast Florida with a Category 4 hurricane making landfall. In this case, we have the potential for 13 feet above ground storm tide in Fernandina Beach, about 14 feet at Mayport Naval Station near the ship basin. Near the uh, City Hall in Jacksonville Beach, we'd be looking at about 10 feet above ground, and in St. Augustine Beach, similar, about 10 to 12 feet. What we do here in Jacksonville is we boil it down to what does this mean for the local level. That includes working with emergency operations centers and others involved in evacuation decisions. Jacksonville's EOC held emergency hurricane preparedness exercises in late May. So are they ready? We're very ready. We've had a lot of experience at this. We've, uh, we've had a lot of practice exercises. We've had a lot of real-time exercises. We've had hurricanes, floods, you name it, and I think we've done very well. They are ready, at least as much as they can be, but what about when it comes to the storm surge? There isn't much anyone can do, except to make sure you are not there. That means if authorities give the order to evacuate, you go, and you go immediately. What you can do is to have a plan and be prepared long before then. And there are plenty of resources out there all set to go and available to help you with that plan, such as the American Red Cross, local media outlets, the web, of course. In Duval County, you can get a whole lot of help from the city of Jacksonville at this site, jacksready.com. And of course, that's J-A-X ready.com. And there you're going to find instructions, among other things, on how to put together your own emergency supplies kit, as well as a lot of valuable information and resources. And you know, Terry, a lot of people point to the fact that we really have not had anything happen 50 years since Dora, but um, does that mean that we're just lucky or... What, is, what does that really mean? Well, it would sort of seem that way, and a lot of people think that it does mean just that. They also think there are some reasons that maybe we don't get hit that frequently. But I put that question um, to the director of the Duval County Emergency Operations Center, Mr. Bill Estep, and here's what he told me. We are only lucky until that next big storm comes right at us. The problem is, we don't know when that's going to be. So lucky, yes. Mm -hmm. Complacent, we can't afford to be. So we all need to be prepared because there is one thing that we can guarantee. There will be another storm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, hurricane season runs six months. You just never know what's going to happen. Uh, I do like the fact that Jacksonville and the state of Florida, we're always preparing. We're always doing drills and, and trainings to make sure that we are ready. Got to. Got to. Otherwise, we, we could be in trouble. Absolutely, and JTA does it as well, so You're it's right. all good. Thanks so much, Terry. We appreciate it. You bet. And this reminder on the next Making Moves, our hurricane preparation series continues when we talk with the American Red Cross about a new phone app that could save your life should a hurricane head our way. So you'll want to tune in for that. Jacksonville is in the national spotlight this month as the Conference of Minority Transportation Officials, or COMTO, comes to town. Local officials have been preparing for months for the event that attracts hundreds of transportation professionals. There will be workshops, seminars, time to explore transportation innovations at JTA, and of course, time to network and build relationships. When I first became a CEO back in Atlanta in uh, 2000, I mean, I was able to reach, work, reach out to an immediate network of, uh, of experienced 
CEOs from around the country and be able to learn from their experiences and, and apply that to my career and apply it to my agency. And it was definitely a benefit. Plenty of local commuters, including many JTA employees, left the car, truck, or SUV parked in the driveway on June 20th and hopped on a bus, trolley, or the Skyway, all part of the 8th annual Dump the Pump campaign. I use it every day. I park my car in the garage, in the parking garage, and always use the train, to, the buses, I'm sorry, not the train, the buses to save money on gas and it's more convenient. I ride, ride it about, I don't know, three or four times a week. Um, I gave up my car about six months ago when I went to Africa and um, decided that I could ride the bike, ride the bike and ride the, um, the bus when I got home. Dump the Pump is a national campaign aimed at promoting the cost savings and environmental benefits of public transit. Locally, JTA staffers handed out I Dump the Pump stickers to public transit users as a thank you for their participation. The Prime Osborne Convention Center was a job hunter's paradise on June 10th when Congresswoman Corrine Brown and Jacksonville Mayor Alvin Brown hosted a huge jobs and resource fair. Hundreds of prospective job candidates visited the JTA booth. We have over 100 vendors here, which is great, and it gives us an opportunity to see a lot of qualified people in one place. We have a full range of positions that we hire for. We have planning positions. You know that we build roads and bridges. A lot of people do not know that. So that takes planning, that takes engineers, that takes architects. We have administrative positions, marketing, customer service, um, ethics, printing, the full gamut. Time now for the last word, donation. The JTA recently donated a 14-passenger bus to the Don't Miss a Beat Foundation. DMAB unveiled the bus during a block party in the Brooklyn area of Riverside. The vehicle will be used to pick up students from schools, summer camps, and much more. DMAB was founded back in 2008 by Jacksonville native and Juilliard graduate Ulysses Owens Jr. as a way to use music and the arts to keep kids in school. When you have a chance to see that there's a possibility to be something greater than what you see every day, it can change the path that you're going. And that's honestly what we're trying to do at Don't Miss a Beat, is really let our students know, listen, if you try, we'll expose you to some great things and then just let you know that the sky is the limit. And that's really what we want our kids to know. I never even dreamed that I would end up with something like this. This bus has taken us to a level that we've been trying to get to four or five years. And that wraps up this edition of Making Moves. We'd like to thank Brad Thoburn as well as Terry Casey for joining us in the studio today. And thank you at home as well for tuning in. Remember, if you missed any part of the show or you just want to watch it again, complete episodes of Making Moves are always available online at JTAFLA.com and on our YouTube channel, JTA904. And you can also find exclusive web-only content on our Facebook page. So be sure to check it out at facebook.com slash JTA Making Moves. And for the entire Making Moves team, I'm Joyce Morgan Danford. We'll see you the next time we're Making Moves.